I'd like to welcome everybody to the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center, or CISIAC web webinar. Uh, the title of today's webinar, webinar is Certifying Software Security Testers. Uh, my name is Tom McGibbon from the CISIAC. Um, our pre presenter today is Mr. Taz Daughtry, who I will introduce in a few minutes. Uh, before we begin, I have a few admin comments. Um, all the phones have been muted except for the presenters today. Um, however, questions can be asked at any time during the pre presentation by entering them through either the Q&A or the chat pane in your WebEx control panel. Um, I will be monitoring questions and questions will be answered um, either during the presentation or at the end of the presentation. Uh, many people ask and in fact copies of the slides will be available afterwards. Um, if you would like a copy, please send me a request. My email address is on the, um, is on the screen right now. Also, we're recording this uh, webinar and the video and audio will be posted and we will distribute a link uh, about the webinar, about the video once, it, well, once we have posted the, the video. Um, now, to begin today's presentation, let me then quickly give a brief commercial overview of this CISIAC. Uh, again, please note my email address for any follow-up. But the CISIAC is operated by Quantarian Solutions. Uh, that's who I work for, and it turns out that's who Taz works for. And it is, the CISIAC is funded through the Department of Defense's Defense Technical Information Center, or DTIC. Um, so f funding for today's free webinar is provided in part by DTIC. Uh, the CISIAC is a specialized technical focal point and information clearinghouse for software engineering, information assurance, cybersecurity, modeling and simulation, and knowledge management for DTIC. Uh, please make sure to check out our website and join our community of practice at www.thecisiac.com. Uh, we also have a couple of LinkedIn discussion groups going, um, one titled CISIAC Software Intensive Systems and the other called CISIAC information assurance. Um, one of the things I plan to do is uh, we will set up a discussion group for today's uh, webinar. After the webinar is over, post the questions and answers there. All right, uh, now at, so at this point I'd like to introduce our presenter. Uh, Taz Daughtry is Senior Scientist, scientist at the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center in Quantarian. Um, he is a fellow of the American Society for Quality, the founding editor of the peer-reviewed journal Software Quality Professional, and a director of the American Software Testing Qualifications Board. Uh, in that capacity, he's a key member of the working group developing the international certification for security testers. So now I will turn this presentation over to Taz. Uh, welcome, Taz. Thank you very much, Tom, and welcome everyone. As Tom has indicated, as there are questions or comments, uh, please relay them as uh, you have been instructed, and we'll be delighted to try to handle what we can during the session and also uh, engage in some follow-on afterwards. Uh, my intention today is to begin by setting some framework, uh, mainly discussing some of the why and what and when before we get to the bottom line about who. So as Tom has indicated, I am, uh, as a board member of the American Software Testing Qualification Board, working with an international effort that's setting up a certification for software security testers. But uh, to certainly set the framework of some of the motivation for that, uh, I'll not belabor the point, but we certainly are aware of uh, a number of uh, recent issues and concerns with security. Uh, obviously, to the extent that we are increasingly dependent upon the correct operation of software and software-based systems, whether it's uh, for uh, financial, commercial transactions, or in other very specialized ways that our society depends upon all of the various critical infrastructures uh, functioning, uh, we are very concerned about ways in which people may be trying to breach security and compromise either the confidentiality, the integrity, or the availability of uh, data, sensitive data, or of the systems that store that data. So it's uh, certainly something that's been well publicized whenever there's a major breach, such as during the 
recent uh, holiday shopping season uh, with uh, the uh, Target department store uh, ways in which uh, so many millions, tens of millions of accounts and financial information uh, was uh, exposed. Uh, it turns out, uh, as with most things, if you get behind the headlines, uh, there are really uh, a detailed sequence of things. Uh, in the case of this particular article from a recent issue of Computer World, uh, the author indicates that probably were a sequence of at least six different failures, uh, ways in which the uh, system was not properly configured or operated, uh, that led to uh, the successful uh, security breach. And uh, therefore, it's uh, certainly also an issue to think about all the ways you could avoid that. Of course, I'm concerned about any organization that has the, has the uh, bullseye uh, as, their, uh, as their logo. But I guess our organization and other organizations that have information security in their title sort of have a bullseye uh, drawn on them as well. Uh, so following the similar analysis of uh, what contributed to that security breach, uh, we could look at a number of processes, uh, equipment, procedures, uh, and uh, activities uh, that could help avoid at each of those uh, weak links in that particular chain. And one of the key things to look at, think about it with any of these areas is that uh, testing as a one form of appraisal it would be a key way to confirm whether, in fact, these various uh, activities or processes or procedures have been properly implemented. So, uh, again, not to belabor the point, but clearly uh, the uh, adding of additional types of assessment, such as uh, testing, uh, would have contributed to uh, an understanding of whether or not uh, there was, in fact, these uh, there were in fact these kinds of weaknesses. Um, Moving over to a less well-publicized uh, activity, uh, but interestingly enough, one that probably was even more widespread, the Navy and Marine Corps uh, intranet uh, is uh, next only in size to the in internet, uh, the most extensive uh, network of uh, interconnected computers and users uh, something on the order of about 700,000 users at about 3,000 locations uh, for the non-classified activity, about 70% of the Navy's uh, IT operations uh, running over this particular network. And uh, back in 2002, for a number of months, uh, a number of intruders uh, that uh, were uh, identified subsequently as being uh, based in Iran uh, penetrated uh, this particular network and uh, performed a number of uh, activities for really longer than people had thought and uh, more severely than people had thought, uh, watching, uh, taking information, and basically compromising uh, the integrity of this particular uh, intranet. Uh, once again, there are a number of ways that these uh, issues could have been uh, minimized a uh, couple of key techniques that are mentioned there in terms of threat modeling and uh, intrusion detection. But once again, uh, the, the point would be that uh, as well as you choose to do the various sorts of development activities, uh, there, are, there are appraisal activities that come along, including testing, that could have revealed, uh, subsequently could have revealed weaknesses. Uh, the most interesting thing that I found in the most uh, uh, most recent information that has been released uh, and that will lead to the next point that I want to make or a subsequent point I want to make is that uh, it looks like a contractual uh, gap uh, between the uh, developer, the supplier, Hewlett Packard, and the customer, the, the, the Department of the Navy in terms of not assigning proper responsibility for protection of certain databases, which turned out to be the weak link uh, that allowed the intruders entry and then allowed them to, to move around within the networks. Um, and so uh, it's certainly the case, as one uh, commentator has said, uh, that you do not want to have uh, your situation associated with being like a Dilbert cartoon. Uh, but uh, it, it, it could be something as simple as not writing your contract properly, but who's to confirm that and who is to help you understand where there are those gaps and those missing 
uh, aspects of what needs to be addressed. So again, uh, a sad lesson learned. Uh, so if we can begin to talk about why we do the testing and uh, then what and uh, when as opposed to getting ready into the who, which is the punchline for, for the presentation today, uh, I can think of at least a couple of ways in which we need to talk about the motivation for testing in general and for security testing in particular. Uh, you know you can't test in quality. Uh, you know that you need to uh, have uh, from the beginning planned and carried out uh, in all of your development activities to the extent uh, that is possible, uh, all of the ways in which you build a secure system, you build a system that can be resistant to these uh, intrusions and can be resilient and can recover uh, quickly and uh, relatively uh, painlessly uh, if and when the intrusions occur. But uh, certainly before you put into operation a system and as you're trying to use a system, you need to have some confidence and the amount of confidence that you need to have uh, would indicate the types and the amounts of some of these activities, including testing, needs to be done. And of course, there are a number of appraisal activities, testing being only one. It's primarily a dynamic activity, which happens typically fairly late in the life cycle of a system. And therefore, we want to think about ways in which we can be doing other activities, inspections, audits, walkthroughs, technical reviews of various sorts, in earlier stages of looking at the plans, the uh, requirements, the design, the implementation, uh, because in many ways those are much more cost effective to find and fix the defects sooner. But there are certain types of defects and certain failure modes that really are, are most efficiently and to some extent only possibly revealed through various types of testing. And, and there are certain types of security-based testing that certainly fall into that category. So we may, we may need to have the proper mix and complement the testing that's done uh, to various other types of appraisal activities. And in terms of uh, the motivation of how much of this testing is needed or how much of the uh, appraisal uh, needs to give you confidence, it, it's basically an, an area of adequacy. And once again, uh, one size doesn't fit all. There may be aspects of the system, even a system that's very critical itself, uh, has components that have various degrees of criticality. And so once again, the level of assurance, the level of uh, activity that goes into all of the inspections as well as the test uh, need to be in proportion and provide an adequate basis uh, so that things that have lower criticality don't require as much intensity and things that are the most critical or overall systems that are very critical. Obviously, we're talking about failure modes where we have life-threatening situations, uh, catastrophic financial losses, uh, missions that are critical to the national defense and so forth, then they would be at a very high level of assurance that would be necessary. So all of these are the motivational issues. Um, a second point that I want to make and that really goes back to some of that uh, contractual issue with the uh, Navy Marine Corps uh, intranet uh, dealing with what needs to be tested. Uh, we typically think about testing as being a way of confirming that requirements have been satisfied. And so uh, there certainly are requirements, including security requirements, as well as a variety of functional and other non-functional requirements uh, that you put in a checklist and say, let's confirm that these requirements are met. Uh, but certainly, uh, because we're not going to be able to elaborate all of the types of security uh, that needs to be required and anticipate all the ways that it might be threatened, we need to also be thinking about looking at behavior. What is, what is the secure behavior and how much can testing give us uh, additional assurance, adequate assurance, uh, that the behavior of the system will be secure when it's put into operation. So let's think about dividing the space of, uh, of activities or behaviors uh, into those behaviors that are acceptable things that we allow a system to do and those that are unacceptable. And obviously, from a security point of view, the unacceptable behavior be ways in which uh, we have uh, compromised confidentiality or integrity or availability. So uh, the, the diagram basically says that we can map out in a space uh, those things that the system shall do and other things the system shall not do, and that's sort of a classic way of writing a requirement specification. 
But what about the things that we do not anticipate? What are some things that the system might do? Uh, and this is the situation, you see a little bit of bleed over to the left side there. Uh, certainly there are some things that the system might do uh, that are acceptable, uh, that we didn't specify that the system needs to do this or that we are going to test to see that it does do that. But uh, some subset of the activities that we hadn't specified might still be acceptable. But the real gotcha is, is basically on the right-hand side, and it's the uh, region that's colored beyond the region of the specification of what the system shall not do. And so basically that's where a requirements-based type of testing uh, would, uh, would not be uh, adequate. So let's think about the specifications as uh, driving requirements-based testing. But let's also think about behavior-based or operationally-based testing, which also can identify risk uh, that would be, in this case, unacceptable behavior, insecure behavior of a system that, in fact, uh, we may not uh, specify and therefore we may not uh, drive test to confirm. Uh, so that's certainly one of the issues dealing with what needs to be tested, how much of the system needs to be tested, not just the requirements, but just confirming also the secure behavior. The third uh, W question after why and what would be when, and really for testing, it's uh, more typically phrased, well, how long, how much testing, when, when can we quit? Uh, because uh, whether it's based on testing or any other uh, criterion, uh, we really never release software. As the old joke goes, the software is never released, it just escapes. Uh, if we prefer to have a, a release-based uh, driver for our uh, software, a data-driven uh, driver for software release, then basically we need to think about uh, what will be the signs that we have done enough, and particularly how much testing do we need to have done. Uh, this is a fairly stylized life cycle. This is actually a diagram in the uh, building security in maturity model. Uh, and uh, there are, uh, as I've highlighted, a couple of places where uh, test planning and test conduct is, is indicated. Uh, certainly test planning, even from the very earliest stages, I'd move that over to the left as far as I could, uh, can identify ambiguities and uh, missing requirements. Uh, so when you set out to try to design some tests, uh, or when you begin to think about the risk that you're uh, exposed to, it, it may drive other things than just your test planning and conduct. It may certainly drive your uh, development activities and your other appraisal activities. And as I said, most of the time we think about testing activities associated fairly late in the life cycle, such as where the penetration testing is shown in this diagram. But notice I can also point out a number of other ways in which uh, testing or test-related activities uh, can appear earlier and throughout the life cycle, certainly to the extent that we're talking about risk-based testing we can think about risk analysis, which really is an ongoing activity and uh, can uh, appear at any and all of the stages of development. Uh, from the very beginning, we are doing a, some analysis of ways the system might be abused or misused, so analogous to what uh, requirements uh, analysis is done using uh, use cases. We can talk about people defining misuse cases or abuse cases, and that would be help uh, as the threat modeling uh, yeah, the front end begins to give you some idea of where you need to put your efforts. Uh, and as indicated in this particular model, uh, there are security-specific requirements. But once again, uh, that's some, it's necessary but not sufficient in terms of all the things that should be driving testing. Now in terms of uh, when you're testing and when you know to quit testing, uh, there are two particular types of tests that can be identified. Uh, one of those would be tests that's being done as you are making corrections. Uh, this is a figure from the IEEE standard dealing with uh, software reliability. And one way in which the system is not reliable is if it's, uh, if it's not secure. So one of the failure modes of an unreliable system could be uh, security breaches. Uh, and in this particular instance, uh, the idea is as you are doing testing, and as you are finding and fixing defects, 
uh, you will decrease the rate at which the system will subsequently fail. These are sometimes referred to as reliability growth models. And so if you have, as the uh, lower dotted line indicates, an objective value, uh, your target for, for the failure rate, at which time you do not want to release your software until it's that good, uh, then applying a variety of test and test models uh, of reliability growth can help you see how this failure rate curve is decreasing. So at any given time, uh, you can understand what the rate uh, of failure is and what's projected for it to be, and therefore you should continue to keep testing until you can drive that level down. So this is essentially um, sampling with replacement in the sense that uh, you are making corrections. Every time there's a failure, the failure indicates there's some defect that needs to be corrected, so you find and fix the defect and resume your testing. And presumably by decreasing the number of defects, you are going to decrease the rate at which the system will fail. Uh, this still is, a, is only one side of the risk equation because it doesn't talk about the consequences of those failures, but it's one way in which testing may be driven to uh, have a, a data-driven basis for when to decide. Uh, there's a second type, uh, which is uh, at the end of the testing, at the end of the development, the, act, the uh, acceptance testing, uh, and this is a, a sequential test plan. This is sampling without replacement, where basically you take the supposedly finished system uh, run test against it. Uh, the test here, using the ideas of John Musa and others, would be that you use a distribution of values that models the actual operational profile, and that depending on the frequency with which the system fails, it may either indicate with a statistically strong enough signal that the system is uh, acceptable, as you see the region, the green region, uh, represents on the graph a relatively large number of tests or a long length of uh, testing time with relatively few failures. And given whatever calculations set these uh, regions uh, mathematically, you can uh, determine whether or not you have a strong enough signal to say, I can go ahead and stop testing now, I can accept the system. Or over in the red uh, region, uh, the rate at which the failures are occurring is, are so frequent uh, that it's pretty clear that the system needs to be rejected. So this is a second mode in which you can decide whether or not you have done enough testing or the system is ready to be released. And in both of these cases, uh, the, the earlier one in which we're making replacements as we go along and uh, look at growth models, or in this one in which we have a calculated uh, value of thresholds for when the system statistically is signaled that it can be accepted or rejected, uh, have been applied for reliability in general, and we're now looking at ways in which that can be applied to specific types of failures that deal with uh, security failures. There's some interesting and promising research going on in, in, in the, both of those areas. But uh, this is really the foundation for getting us thinking about uh, the WHO side, and so uh, if I haven't left completely in the dust, I'll take a breath here to see if anything has piled up in terms of questions or comments before I get to uh, the basically the bottom line, which is the whole question about certifying the testers themselves. Um, no, no questions at this point. Tess. Okay, I have baffled people completely, I guess. Thank you, Tom. Um, so the issue now is uh, what contribution can be made in this context in terms of making some decisions about who does the testing. And I'll just say from the very beginning, uh, that uh, if you look at things like capability maturity models, uh, one of the indications of increasing maturity is that you have institutionalized and ultimately optimized uh, your procedures, your processes, so they're not driven by personality. Uh, unfortunately, since most organizations are at some of the lowest levels of uh, immaturity, lowest levels of maturity, they're very immature organizations, they still are very personality dependent. So there's a lot of ad hoc uh, responses that are made. Uh, we need a lot of heroic measures, and uh, certainly to the degree to which we have not yet optimized and institutionalized our procedures, we're not a mature organization. Uh, we will be depending pretty much more on the personalities and the capabilities of individuals. Uh, not that that ever goes away, but the question is how, in fact, can we make uh, this contribution most appropriate. Capers-Jones offers this schematic uh, in which we're looking at, on the vertical axis, 
uh, the rate at which people are making mistakes and injecting defects into a system, and on the horizontal axis during various stages of development, uh, how well those defects are being identified and removed. And again, uh, testing being only one of the contributors and one of the late contributors, but contributor of a certain type of uh, uh, defect identification. Uh, and so from Caper's point of view, we, we have uh, the upper region, which he actually wants to uh, institutionalize as a region of malpractice, hold people accountable uh, for such poor practice of injecting defects and not removing them, uh, to, uh, as we move down to the lower right, a best-in-class. And uh, overlaid on a number of these are some of the things that help do that, uh, specifically dealing with testing. If you notice in the middle box, which is about the U.S. average, which is not extraordinary, uh, a lot of that is associated with tests that are being done only by developers. And other types of testing and other modes of testing uh, contribute as you drive this thing down to ultimately uh, getting into uh, best in class. And at least Jones's indication is there's some improvement. It's not an extraordinary uh, breakthrough, but there's some improvement associated with testing that's done by certified testers. Uh, so once again, if the organization's relatively immature, uh, we may depend upon the uh, personalities and the characteristics and, and even sometimes the heroic measures of, of the testers and others to contribute to, to the success. So the indication is that there, there might be some contribution from, uh, from certification of testers. Uh, and there's no lack of uh, attempts to identify uh, just in the area of security. Uh, these are the, uh, the badges and the logos of the sponsoring organizations of a variety of uh, recognitions, certifications, or, or not technically licensures, but they're called licensed here, of uh, folks that are dealing with aspects, particularly uh, the one recognized uh, flavor of testing that's unique to software security, a penetration testing, some more badges uh, in terms of uh, what are called ethical hackers, that is, people that are performing the same function that a malicious intruder would have, but uh, for purposes of trying to identify and remove those. Uh, and so it's interesting that there already are uh, these uh, variety of uh, certifications for individuals in, in aspects of testing. Um, and even more broadly, uh, the vendor in, independent uh, Security Plus recognition, which includes a component of that included, is, is, is testing. Uh, and uh, at the bottom of this, the Secure Software Lifecycle Professional, which again is a recognition that throughout the development lifecycle, there are some contributions of testing as well as all the other techniques to help build uh, a more likely um, secure system. So all of this is out there, and uh, just to set the stage for what we are trying to to say and mean by certification um, in any particular situation, such as uh, looking for secure software uh, and software-based systems, there are certain required knowledge, skills, and abilities. And uh, we can sort of identify what we want people to, to be able to contribute. And then there are a variety of ways that individuals can acquire those knowledge, skills, and abilities. You can have uh, self-study, you can uh, sit in in uh, formal training sessions, or you can just get uh, on-the-job experience. So there are a variety of ways that uh, you can acquire the skills uh, that are needed, and then, then the issue simply becomes uh, how can we bridge the gap to say that what you have acquired is what is required. Uh, and there are a number of ways, some of them very simple-minded, such as simply saying if you sit through if you complete a particular course of study, um, uh, you, uh, to some extent, in a very minimal sense, uh, we can sort of map that what you have acquired is, is what was required. Uh, more formally, we can uh, give people examinations. We can ask questions or give them problems to solve. Or if it's something that's more activity-based, we can have someone actually demonstrate uh, a performance. Uh, so think about that, for example, if there is a, knowledge and ability before you give someone a driver's license, uh, there's a written component, there's an examination component uh, that uh, simply because you complete a driver training course <laughs> may not 
do the mapping. And so we have a written exam. Do you, do you know the rules of the road or how do you respond to these situations? And then you also need to demonstrate because you need to have an on-the-job, uh, on-the-road actual uh, demonstration that you can properly uh, perform at some minimal level of expectation. And when we, in fact, have mapped what has been acquired against what, has, what is required, uh, we can offer some recognition. And in the case of uh, formal educational experiences, uh, people can be granted uh, academic diplomas or they can be awarded degrees. Uh, in the case of various types of training, uh, we may, uh, we may uh, provide certificates or recognitions of various sorts. And if, as in the case of driving or in the case of uh, other very specialized professional skills, uh, people need to demonstrate their abilities before they are permitted to perform the activity, uh, they can be licensed. Uh, so there's licensure, again, at the minimal level for the driver, the driver's license, uh, and uh, at the professional level there's licensure, uh, recognition that someone is given a permission uh, to perform uh, an activity, whether it's a uh, medical, uh, legal, engineering activity, uh, professional licensure. Uh, and uh, interestingly enough, professional engineer, comma, software, the recognition that software is a, uh, a discipline within engineering uh, is being recognized by a number of, of states in the United States. And so uh, in specific cases where it's required that someone have a professional engineering designation, if in fact that applies to the software that's going into a system, uh, there will now be a licensure capability for that as well. Uh, but uh, more typically, these things are done informally, and as the previous charts indicate, a lot of people all across the board are throwing up various types of certificates and recognitions. What I want to talk about uh, as the, uh, the subject, the core of today's presentation, is the way in which a particular uh, certification process is evolving uh, for individuals that are we recognize as uh, security testers. And that's within the International Software Testing Qualification Board. Uh, this is the home page uh, of the ISTQB. Uh, and I am a member of the American Board. It's organized around national boards, the ASTQB, American Software Testing Qualification Board. Uh, and uh, I just want to give you some background on how that whole certification process works and then the specifics of the ongoing activity that's uh, recognizing, uh, will recognize uh, security testers. Uh, so essentially at the international level, uh, the, uh, the framework that's set up for each of the certifications is in the form of uh, syllabi. Uh, and so uh, what in other certifications might be called a body of knowledge uh, is referred to as a syllabus for each of the certifications in the ISTQB arena because it also specifies uh, the required components of a training course, if in fact uh, a training course is to be accredited. Now, once again, individuals, as they can in other professionals areas, uh, can acquire certification uh, you can even become a license. You can be licensed to practice law without having graduated from law school. Uh, you can read the law, you can self-study, and you can pass the bar exam. So uh, it's not required that people have training, but because training is often a component of preparation for the certification, uh, the body of knowledge is actually formulated as a series of syllabi. And then it is up to the national or member boards of the international affiliation uh, to uh, if there are training providers who want to be accredited against uh, the particular uh, syllabus, uh, they do that accreditation and they also establish uh, exam questions for each of the areas. And then in some cases there is a separate examination board. In the American case, the, the member board is also the examination board that, that actually administers the exams and issues the certificates. Uh, and as I said, in preparation for uh, an individual sitting a, a certification exam, uh, they may prepare uh, taking a training course and uh, at least for the sake of having some sort of indication of its value, uh, they can see if the training provider has been accredited 
because, in fact, uh, that is another function in which the, the member board provides uh, a mapping to show that they adequately address the elements and that they have a proper approach to doing the training, including uh, the content and the uh, uh, presenters, the instructors. Uh, and as a result of whatever preparation and of uh, passing the examination, an individual can become a certified tester against uh, each of the various components. Uh, and I'll show the three layers shortly um, that it is the progression. Uh, for a system that's been in uh, place uh, for, for less than a decade, it's be, become uh, extremely well accepted. Uh, again, most of these are the foundational levels, but they're certificates, certificate holders uh, worldwide. Uh, and that, uh, that number has uh, increased very dramatically and continues to grow, particularly as new certifications are being added. So as I said, the syllabus is called that because it's a basis for, for the training, but it's also the basis for the examination. So essentially, um, you take the body of knowledge, the components, uh, and you basically indicate in proportion each of the areas of the syllabus how much relative effort should go into presenting the material and therefore how much uh, it will be expected, how much weighting there will be on the examination. The other piece of the syllabus is that every of the learning objectives uh, is specified in terms of a particular knowledge level. So again, if anyone's familiar with the Bloom's taxonomy in terms of whether people have to simply recall uh, some factual information or they have to do some very uh, elaborate, synthetic, uh, creative work with, uh, with the material, uh, that is explicitly identified so that people have an understanding of, of what degree of mastery is, is needed. Uh, the examinations uh, at the, at the so-called foundational level and at the level above that are simply multiple choice. And I'll have to say uh, people don't necessarily recognize how difficult it is to design a really good multiple choice question uh, for some of this content material that's well beyond the level of just recall. Uh, and all this is examined pretty carefully. There's a cyclomatic, uh, uh, psychometric analysis that is done uh, of exam results of what questions are are or not to be included, uh, and basically all of the all the material is refreshed as a result of of exam results, uh, where uh, we indicate some of these questions are just not good questions and are not in indicative of um, the the ability that the uh, the person who's taking the test needs to demonstrate. Uh, multiple choice questions, uh, numbers and, and times are there. And as you move to the expert level, uh, there's more time and more elaborate questions, including essays, uh, that will be necessary. So um, that is in proportion or distribution of the, of the nature of the uh, type of examination. And once again, uh, the amount of uh, material that is on the exam is already indicated in the syllabus of which areas are more to be emphasized and also the distribution of, um, of difficulty. So the levels of knowledge uh, are also indicated. Just to give you the specifics, uh, basically uh, the, the knowledge levels, the so-called K levels, run from K1 to K6, which is a little bit of an extension of uh, the set of the Bloom's taxonomy. Uh, so here are examples from the draft of the current uh, expert level uh, certification, examination, uh, the learning objectives at the K2 level. You see simply the word understand. Um, at the K3 level, they need to be able to do something to design. And the K4 level, they need to analyze. And so in each of these cases, uh, the syllabus will indicate these are what people would need to be able to learn if they're taking a training course or what they need to be able to demonstrate if they're taking the exam. And uh, I've, I've lost my K5 and K6 off of this picture. I don't know what uh, just happened, but essentially if you can see, uh, these are definitely much higher level uh, cognitive uh, capabilities in terms of keywords here like evaluate, specify and justify, uh, and so in fact, um, it can be some fairly detailed ways in which people need to, de to demonstrate control of, of the material. 
So here are the three levels. Uh, entry level uh, with no requirement for any uh, experience, walk in off the street, foundation level. Uh, basically, it's to get a common uh, understanding and basically a, a, a common understanding and control of vocabulary. There's a glossary that spans all of these, but one of the things that happens, you can imagine, at the foundational level is to make sure people just understand what the terminology is and a consistent way that we use that terminology and the key concepts. And uh, after you pass the foundation level and you have a number of uh, years of experience on the job specific to testing, uh, you would be qualified to take uh, any or all of the advanced level uh, certifications uh, dealing with the nature of the work that you have. And that can include managing the test uh, or analyzing, or at a more technical level, uh, the technical test analyst. Uh, and that, in fact, is the launch pad that is indicated there over to security testing. Uh, so you have to be foundation level certified to go for any of the advanced levels. And then uh, the expert levels, which require uh, at least one advanced level as a prerequisite, plus more years, say, up to, say, seven years of experience on the job before you're even eligible to take the exam, uh, uh, you see are uh, distributed across a number of levels, including uh, improving the test process, managing the test process. Uh, there's another expert level on automating testing, and the one that we're currently dealing with that's in process now is on security testing. In this case, as the uh, diagram indicates, the specific requirement is that after a foundation certification, uh, you must um, pass the technical test analyst before you can apply for the security testing. And that's because we're presupposing uh, control of and mastery of not just the foundational fundamentals and the, uh, the basic vocabulary and the like, but also the, the content of the technical material as well. And if we're trying to specify what is expected of an expert, uh, some of the key words and phrases that are identified there, uh, hearkening back to my earlier comments about uh, risk and also even more broadly business needs, uh, is that an expert actually has to bring to bear and guide testing uh, based on those uh, fairly extensive and, and uh, fairly subtle at times areas of, of, uh, of mastery of information. We also know that there are a variety of perspectives, uh, a number of ways, a user perspective, uh, uh, various other stakeholders involved, uh, and that, that as you plan and carry out and evaluate your testing, uh, there are a number of ways to look at it and a number of ways to evaluate it. And so that, in fact, is another expectation. And finally, because there, you have to, as the Red Queen says, run as fast as you can just to stay in place and twice as fast to get anywhere, uh, we know that there are tools and automation that can help with the testing. And once again, uh, an expert needs to be aware of the tools, aware of, of the capabilities that can be applied and make the most appropriate decisions. And so very specific questions dealing with all of these aspects of uh, expectations will be in the certification. Here are the top level categories. Uh, the idea is that uh, if a training course is offered, it will be approximately a one week long training course. That's the other model we have for some of the advanced and for the expert level, uh, that people will sit in a full day class for a week, uh, drink from the proverbial fire hose, and that uh, with some variation, and I haven't included the relative amount of time for each of these areas, uh, there'll be some uh, relative emphasis on these different topics. And one of the things I would encourage anyone who has an interest and particularly wants to provide some feedback is if they see something here or in the breakdown, I'm going to show you the next couple of slides, uh, about what is included or even what's not included and the relative emphasis that should be addressed to that in putting it into the syllabus, both for training and primarily for the distribution of questions on the exam, I'd love to have that feedback. Just to expand each of these areas, uh, the context, uh, 
and uh, goals. This is part of the business needs areas that uh, we would expect an expert to be conversant with. Uh, certainly in terms of setting the scope for the testing, and as I've indicated, risk-based is, is the key area. All testing now uh, is primarily uh, framed in terms of risk-based uh, approaches, and security is, is certainly no different and really requires that analysis. Uh, and in terms of planning various sorts of testing processes, there's some things that are common across all types of tests, uh, and there's some things, obviously, that are specific and unique to the tests that are done dealing with security. If, in fact, we're testing to see whether the security controls and mechanisms are in place, we need a whole long uh, list. I think there are about 10 mechanisms actually in this subsection. I just used encryption as a reminder of one of those uh, firewalls and a variety of other techniques that are in place now. And then because uh, social engineering uh, reveals that human is so much often the weak link, uh, the whole idea of training and testing against uh, training of individuals and their performance would be an aspect. We need to look at the life cycle of the software and the life cycle that parallels it for security. And so through all of the development activities and the superimposed appraisal activities, where does testing fit in? How does testing benefit from other types of activities? Where does it, where does it contribute to other types of activities? Uh, I've already mentioned the human factors. And a final breakdown slide here, uh, as you're running the test, um, how do you analyze, how do you report out various levels, uh, reporting to developers, reporting to management, uh, because there are so many tools, and particularly there's a lot available unique to software, security concerns, how do you select those tools, how do you implement the tools, how do you make a cost-benefit analysis of which tools are appropriate, and to be aware of the, the industry, uh, the standards that are in place, and uh, the way in which the industry is growing, because unfortunately, uh, it's a moving target, and uh, it's almost a spy versus spy every time the defense uh, masters one area, plugs one hole, the offense finds another hole uh, to work through. And so those exploits continue, and so one of the things that people need to be aware of is how they get resources, how they get updates in terms of information about uh, what is evolving and what things need to be of concern as they're thinking about new and additional threats and ways that testing would be examining that. So here is where we, we stand now. Uh, essentially, um, we are in a committee uh, draft mode. I'm working on several of the sections with colleagues, uh, international colleagues uh, from a couple of other continents, as a matter of fact. Uh, and what we're trying to deal with in the uh, in the drafting uh, through this year, and we're going to have a major face-to-face -face meeting again in June, uh, is to try to get that beta version to a point that it can be made available for review. So right now I've invited you uh, to provide comments and questions, and at a very high level simply indicate it. Here are the, here's the approach we use. Uh, here's the path you would use to get to being able to take the exam, here's what would be expected of you. Uh, the level at which we then want to be talking about uh, the uh, details, what kinds of questions, what learning objectives would be in each of the sections is being hammered out. And later this year, as that beta version becomes available for external review, uh, we certainly want to be able to uh, encourage uh, the wider community and if any of you would either want to be involved or suggest people, organizations that need to be involved, um, this is not proprietary, this is not closed by any means. Uh, we want to begin uh, to get all of those views in incorporated because we're doing the best we can of understanding uh, the lay of the land, the industry, and the requirements. Uh, there are many other people out there that have other perspectives that come from different industries that have different stakeholder points of view, so we really would appreciate having those uh, available to us so that we can launch the exam uh, beginning next calendar year. Uh, we expect there'll be um, a fairly limited uptake early on because as indicated, the two prerequisites are uh, being both a foundation level and a technical test analyst level certified as well as having on-the-job experience. 
and I believe for the other expert level, uh, they have indicated something in the order of seven years uh, of actual experience. I don't know how narrowly it will be defined as that seven years have to be dealing with security testing or they simply need to deal with testing on the one hand or a mixture of that and security concerns that aren't just to testing on the other hand. That would be another issue that I'd be delighted to have your feedback on. So essentially, uh, tried to lay out a foundation in terms of uh, why we need to do testing, uh, security testing specifically, uh, what should be tested, uh, when and for how long we should be doing the testing, uh, and now the component of who can do the testing, who can contribute the testing, and if in fact certification is a mechanism to give people a better uh, connection between what is required and expected and what can benefit uh, from individuals' knowledge and experience, uh, to improve uh, the testing and, and the overall delivery of a system that is meant to be secure, uh, then that's what we're trying to accomplish. So uh, with that, uh, as Tom has indicated, we'll have uh, some time now and uh, offline afterwards to carry on some questions and discussions, and there is, is my contact information. So. Uh, Tom, back to you. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Taz. Uh, mm -hmm. Very excellent. Um, let's see. I do, we do have a few questions, but before we get to the questions, uh, we do want to get some feedback from you all on on the presentation. So I would ask John if he could to uh, post the uh, a poll. Uh, there's a couple. There's two or three questions about the about the presentation that was just given. Um, so while you're answering that, I'll move on to the quest, a few of the questions here. Um, let's see. Uh, one of the questions is how does your exam or certification compare with current DoD IA workforce qualification requirements? I have not done uh, direct mapping. I know that there are, in fact. Uh, some fairly detailed uh, role-based uh, requirements uh, for, for training uh, across the Defense Department specifically, and uh, I certainly would like to be able to, to map that here. Uh, one of the difficulties is that this exam itself doesn't happen in isolation, so what I need to go back and make sure I understand is what would be achieved in the foundational level, and specifically, obviously, what would be achieved in that intermediate step of the technical training, a technical testing certification. So I have not pulled all those pieces together, uh, but certainly one of the things we'd like to be able to do is to advertise and even to target, when we get finished, this maps as closely as we can say to X, Y, and Z of that. And I'm taking that as an action item right now because it's something I really hadn't had a chance to get back to. But I know there's a lot of role-based uh, expectations and requirements, specifications uh, for uh, for different people that are working in areas of information assurance. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, does there, does uh, data exist with all the people that have gone through certification? Does data exist on what the impact has been of the certified testers and you know the return on investment, if you will, or anything like that? Right. Uh, well, certainly, uh, Capers Jones uh, would have sort of schematically has placed that a notch below or a notch better than uh, just uh, having the developers do their own testing or testing that's done without uh, particular credentials of individuals. And I don't know uh, directly what that has come from. In the ISTQB world, uh, uh, again, there's anecdotal evidence. Uh, there are certainly some organizations we're actually going to be uh, hosting a conference out in San Francisco in a couple of weeks, and I know some companies uh, that have had a large number of their individuals certified uh, have some great success stories to tell. The point is that it doesn't happen in isolation, and so once again, to think about this back to the maturity of your organization, uh, you'd be fighting a lonely battle in a very disorganized organization um, if you were trying to apply uh, the principles that you, for example, have been certified as, as mastering. Uh, the, the places that I think people are beginning to see uh, some return on that investment is when they get large proportion or entire testing teams. The analogy is I'm thinking about in the um, 
in the uh, Software Engineering Institute world, uh, the personal uh, uh, process uh, and then the team process uh, of basically saying uh, you as an individual um, need to improve, but then you need to have enough people to have a, a critical mass of folks on a team. So that's a, uh, uh, that's probably analogous there. So I, I know that the ISTQB would like to have data, and of course, because the numbers are still fairly small on the expert level and very few, uh, just because you have to go through the other two steps, uh, I don't know that. But I think that's something we certainly should map and we should we should track. And one of the things we should find out is if people are not getting the return on investment uh, for the certification, we should be making adjustments to certification. So that's, again, an open issue where I think we should have a feedback loop on that. Sure, sure. Okay. Um, this one person wants to know, it's the same person that asked about the IA workforce. He just wants to know if, if you believe that this uh, certification should be incorporated into this into the IA workforce quality. Well, you know, it, actually, I sit on um, a group, a community of practice within the DoD, uh, and have actually given a portion of this uh, talk there, as well as in the software and uh, supply chain assurance workshop that they co-sponsor with DHS and with NIST. And um, it, it's a hard sell just to get people to buy into certain testing practices, much less certifying individuals. So I think that the, the certified individual is already going to, you're going to have to already buy into the idea of their, of the, of the, uh, the body of knowledge or the syllabus. So the first sell is going to be to convince these organizations to practice it or to, to salute that particular uh, type of testing. And then once they buy into that, the certification would follow because then they could say, well, let's have the individuals be certified against that. But right now it's a hard sell just to convince any of these organizations that they need to uh, buy into a particular um, – it's not a – I don't want to say a particular methodology because it, it's, it's still fairly – uh, application and tool agnostic, but in certainly a, a certain approach, even just like saying risk-based testing. But certainly that's the direction we go, and I've been I've been beating that drum uh, in a couple of settings already, and I'll certainly want to keep pushing it that way. And I, I, I enjoy having a conversation with that and other individuals who find themselves in that particular <coughs> setting, so we can keep talking right. about that. Okay, okay. Um, this one person uh, that's attending here. Um, is studies. He may be thinking of meeting government requirements, but does does this exam certification handle like handicapped persons and blind people and dyslexic and stuff like that? Yes. Well, actually, the the the, the examinations themselves are done uh, uh, through uh, accepted, um, publicly accessible uh, exam providers. Um, I'm completely blanking on uh, mm -hmm. the, the name of the organization that does it, but, but name a couple of groups that have these test centers around the country, and, and we are tied into one or both. Oh, to test centers. Okay. Those. I see. Okay. Okay. That's good. Mm -hmm. That's good. Um, Go to the website. That's right. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, this one person wants to know, I think this would be the, the last question, okay. is, uh, would, would efforts be made uh, will efforts be made to integrate this into existing security professional certifications? Well, you, you know, everyone sort of has their own piece of the turf, and uh, they defend that. I think it should be a subset or an expansion of something like that uh, life cycle uh, certification. And so uh, certainly if some of these organizations are aware of what we're doing and vice versa. Uh, I know that my main professional affiliation is the American Society of Quality. They have a certified software quality engineer, and we've looked at extensions to that in terms of, of addressing different areas. Uh, so that would certainly be a possibility. I might just mention it wasn't in the talk, but uh, there are other extensions uh, within the ISTQB. For example, there's an Agile uh, extension, which is now because, being recognized because there are some unique aspects of agile methodologies for development, how you address that through testing. So even this certification scheme itself addresses those broader areas, and I think uh, we certainly would like to have some cross-pollination with folks who do certifications on broader areas like quality engineering or, or secure software development. Okay. Stay Very tuned. Good. Okay. okay. Well, thank you very much again, Taz. Uh, it's it's one o'clock here, uh, 
just about on the East Coast. Uh, so I thank you very much. Um, I thank everybody for attending and those that ask questions. Um, uh, again, Taz has got his email address here. I had put my email address up before. Uh, and if you want copies of these slides, feel free to send either Taz or myself uh, an email, and we will send you copies of the slides. So um, I guess that's it for now, and we will be uh, back in touch with all of you uh, for our next presentation. Thank you, Tess. Thank you very much, Tom.